Hello everyone, thank you for making it to the last session and listening to me and my colleague Sheila talk to you about how we've been using the Royal Astronomical Society archives in astronomy education activities. We're going to outline the background to the workshops, how we chose an audience, how we planned them, what it was like to run the programme, the immediate impact on the participants and next steps with our library or archive-based outreach activities. So the Royal Astronomical Society has about 4,000 members. We exist to promote the study and the understanding of astronomy and geophysics. It's achieved this through a range of activities since it was founded in 1820. For example, by organising meetings like the National Astronomy Meeting depicted here, awarding medals and grants, publishing research, and also maintaining a library and archive. In recent years, the Society has prioritised supporting outreach and education activities in astronomy and geophysics, appointing Sheila Kanani as Outreach, Education and Diversity Officer in 2014. So, um, before 2014, there wasn't much education and outreach being done at the RAS. And what was done was done on a completely ad hoc basis. But in order to fulfill our charitable and society objectives, I was hired. Um, as you've heard, I come from a science background, so my PhD is all to do with planetary science. But during that time, I realized that I preferred talking about science rather than doing it. Um, so I went and retrained as a teacher. And then the job at the RAS came up and it kind of married together all my loves. So um, it's been a really exciting time for me working there. Um, at the same time, the RAS wanted to show that it was a more outward-looking society and open up the building to um, the general public in ways that we hadn't done before. In 2020, we've got our bicentenary, and part of that is um, part of the objectives for that are going to be working with new audiences, particularly those not traditionally engaged with astronomy and geophysics. And as the diversity officer, I've also got a, a hidden agenda of trying to get more diversity into everything that we do. Um, the Caroline and Comets project is just one of many things that we offer. So Sheila's mission to develop new audiences matched my remit to increase the use of the library and the archives to fulfil the Society's charitable aim of promoting the understanding of ast astronomy and geophysics. And this means not just providing a service to fellows and external researchers who are already specialists in their subject, but making the collections and what we can learn from them accessible to members of the public who might have varying levels of pre-existing understanding. So events like public lectures and open house are already really popular, but we wanted to find a way of broadening the demographic of people able to use our collections. So I was already working with secondary school children. I teach GCSE astronomy. And it became apparent that um, one of the areas where we could choose the audience would be primary school students, um, particularly age uh, sort of nine to 10, year five, which tends to be when the space topics are covered in the curriculum. We were keen to make our program very cross-curricular because obviously in primary school, it's not just about science. It's, well, it's not really about science, unfortunately. Um, and we also wanted to have some sort of meaningful interaction with the young people coming into the building. I secured some funding from the European Space Education Resource Office, all to do with astronaut Tim Peake's mission into space, and that gave us the idea to formulate this um, project. We particularly also wanted to think about um, improving science capital, so this is this sort of interaction with the public, with um, science, scientific collections and buildings, and I based some of our um, decisions on the, uh, the Aspires report, which is done by King's University, on how primary school um, students are actually where we should be focusing our attention to. So we knew that we wanted to um, reach primary school students and we had to think about a focus and we realised that we had a common um, love of Caroline Herschel so our first, uh, the RAS's first president was William Herschel. Caroline Herschel was his sister. Um, she was quite a woman, and I'm embarrassed to admit that I actually hadn't heard of her in my studies until joining the RAS. She discovered eight comets. 
she was awarded our gold medal in 1828 and another woman wouldn't win that award until 1996. She had a really tough life until she moved to the UK and then she helped her, 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 she helped her brother with astronomy and then became a, an astronomer in her own right. And we have her observation notebooks in the archives. So it was kind of serendipitous that all these things married together. We met some actors from um, an organisation called Spectrum Drama who've been working with the National Maritime Museum and the Royal Observatory Greenwich. And they had Caroline within their historical characters um, database. So we worked with them to, to formulate her character further using the, the archives that we've got. And we could concentrate on her history and comets. And it was nice because it linked to the RAS, it linked to my um, background, but it also provided a female role model, um, particularly in astronomy, which is some, you know, a place that lots of, uh, lots of role models tend to be male. Um, it also happened that I was able to make an analogy of a comet using kind of household materials. So that played into what we wanted to do. And at the time, around 2014, was when a spacecraft called the Rosetta spacecraft was um, actually met a, a comet after 10 years flying through space and orbited for two years. So everything came together really nicely. Our collection skills and resources worked together to make our workshop. So in terms of delivering the workshop, it's, um, we had to base it around our building. We have a lecture theatre, we have the library and we have a meeting room. So we had three rooms that we could use. And um, we, we did it as a three part carousel where students would interact for 30 minutes in each room and then move around so that they have the full experience. We started with a pilot of just a small number of primary school students and then expanded so that the whole programme can actually take 60 students at a time, which tends to be a full year group. Um, it's quite something hearing sort of young people moving about our very old building. And I think some of the staff were quite surprised when it happened for the first time. Um, logistically, the building is old. We have to do lots of health and safety and risk assessments. Also with working with things like dry ice, we have to show the young people that they have to respect a lot of the, the, the building as well as the archives that they come into, um, into, into play with. We had to think about things like safeguarding and making sure that people who were with the children had DBS checks. And then um, in terms of the costs involved, it wasn't too high cost because um, we, this was in our work remit, so we did this for free. And then with the funding, we could buy some of the resources that we needed and pay for the actor. So in the three-part carousel, the students um, meet Caroline Herschel, played by an actor from Spectrum Drama, for 30 minutes. They interact with her observation books in the, um, observation notes in the library with Sean, and then um, for the last 30 minutes they have a science lecture by me about comets, and then we make a comet at the end. So the comet demonstration is quite fun. Um, I start with about a 20-minute talk with pictures and slides about m missions to comets and um, some information about what comets are actually made from. So they're basically a big dirty snowball that live at the edges of space way past Pluto and they're made from ice because there's leftover material from when the sun formed and it's so far away from um, the sun that it's ice is and they, ha they orbit the sun but on a highly elliptical orbit so they only orbit every 80 to 100 years and we talk about the fact that the next comet um, that, come, that will come into play will be in 2061 um, when the young people will be lot, a lot older and some of the teachers won't be around. So that's quite a sobering experience. Um, and then I do the demonstration. So because of the emissions to comets, we've learnt what comets are made from and we use um, analogies that we can find in the kitchen or at home. So for example, um, we talk about methane. Um, on Earth, you can find methane in cow farts and we talk about... Um, alcohols and, and we pour all these things into a bowl and then we add dry ice or frozen carbon dioxide to the to the mix and that freezes all the components into a big dirty snowball but it looks quite spectacular at the same time and then it's the library session um, this starts off 
uh, much more sedately looking at drawings of telescopes made by William Herschel from 7 to 20 to 40 feet high. We have a small collection of instruments and objects and among them are some of the smaller speculum mirrors that William Herschel made for his telescopes. We bring one out for the children and invite them to examine it, imagine starlight bouncing off the mirror into the eyes of the astronomer using the telescope. I mean, as Sheila explained, there are often three sessions running simultaneously. So looking at this speculum mirror for children who already had like an audience with the actor Caroline Herschel gives them a chance to connect that shiny precision made object with Caroline's anecdote of sieving horse manure to make the mould that the speculum mirror would be cast in. So we try to connect these sessions in, in various different ways. Having talked about the equipment that you need to carry out astronomical observations, we talk about the practice of keeping a diary or journal to record those observations. And the image here shows <coughs> Caroline's first sighting of what would turn out to be her third comet of the eight that she discovered. The children find her handwriting fairly easy to read, and they're quite willing to read it out loud in spite of unfamiliar letters and words. And in a group, we interpret the text and the image. For example, we ask, why is the comet sketched in a circle? And what is the impact of weather on astronomical observations? Now, um, as Victoria said, providing access to fragile manuscripts always has to be balanced with the preservation needs of the document. There are several different notebooks covering a number of years of observations. And the aim is to use a different notebook each time so that there's no burden placed unduly on one manuscript for these sessions. If the group is large, the notebook is placed in a glass case and we only look at this page opening. If it's a smaller group of, say, seven or fewer, and there are loads of adults to help su supervise, we will, as a group, all be able to look at the manuscript. I can turn the pages and that way the children can see how Caroline Herschel steadily charted the progress of this celestial object across the sky, allowing her to build the hypothesis that this is actually a comet and not another kind of you know, thing that you would see. So Sheila has touched on Halley's Comet. We bring other parts of our collections into the last part of the library session. You can see the photograph of the 1910 apparition of Halley's Comet here. We have been like from the 1880s to the 1970s, the society collected loads of pictures from observatories around the world, which it copied and sold to its fellows for teaching and research. So we're not selling analogue photos anymore, but we do have loads of <laughs> pictures of Halley's Comet, probably printed off in 1986, during the, the last time Halley's Comet came around. So, you know, this is just a good bit of stock for us to use for a matching pairs exercise. We, I, I'll hand out the photographs to the group. I asked the children to find somebody else who's got a photograph that looks exactly like theirs. Once everyone's matched up with somebody else, that they turn over the label. As a group, we all read out the date and the, the place that the um, comet was photographed. And, and then the children realise, wow, that this, this um, comet was photographed over a period of months from April to June that year. And it reinforces the point that comets behave really differently to, say, meteors like a flash in the pan or, or, or stars or the moon um, it's, it's, a, it's a, a manifestation that's going to be there for se several m months so after that we invite the children to have a go at doing their own observations we hand out black paper and white pencils and invite them to you know draw from the photographs on the table and this helps to reinforce Sheila's lesson on what comets are like, that the anatomy of a comet, the coma and the tail. And you know, a lot of children just really enjoy drawing. Um, it, it's part of our cross-curricular approach. So we've been running this programme for maybe two years and um, maybe just over two years. And we have offered it within the RAS and sometimes out to schools as well if they can't get in. Um, we're slightly limited by the fact that our building is in central London, so we have been a, a little bit too London-centric for my liking, but there's nothing we can do about that. Um, we have reached over 450 students outside of the RAS, 
and we've had over 400 into the RAS over the over the last few years and that's um, over 10 schools um, working with over 10 schools within the area we we've offered this program or versions of this program to undergraduates teacher training and adult audiences as well and it's always been really well received so we're not driven by evaluation at the RAS but we should do more of it um, and it would be useful particularly if we are funded externally again um, but in terms of verbal feedback the kids love the wow factor of the different sessions and they particularly like being in such an old building and looking at an old library um, and they like our toilets because they're kind of posh um, and the, the teachers appreciate the cross-curricular nature of the program the fact that it's really attention grabbing um, and it does link to the curriculum with the space um, the space topic and the interaction with the library is obviously the main um, attraction there. We have, have had some nice um, feedback in, in, from questionnaires and we also got set, sent a set of letters that the teachers made the students write and um, we, so we've got this big stack of um, anecdotal, um, anecdotal evidence of how positive our pro project has been um, but there are always places to improve obviously. One of the issues with the impact is that it tends to be one-off impact. Um, we see the students once and then we don't interact with them ever again. So we can't really measure um, how impactful it has been. But anecdotally, it's all been good. So it's, it, it has been hard to improve because we've had so, so much positive feedback. But we're very aware that we need to do more evaluation and better evaluation um, in order to measure what we need to do. In terms of um, furthering this particular project, we want to stretch it out to different um, historical figures um, based on the collections that we've got. So, for example, Sir Isaac Newton, because we own a first edition Principia in which he highlights um, quite a lot of his main laws and the, the idea of gravity. And we also have a piece of apple wood from Wallsthorpe Manor, which is where he used to live. So I kind of spin that into, it's a piece of the tree that he sat under when the apple fell on his head. Um, and we also want to um, do a project similar to this one, but with Ada Lovelace. One of the big issues with formulating new projects is funding issues, but there we go. Um, it's been really nice because it's been the first big thing that Sean and myself have worked on together. It's been nice because we've been teaching um, new audiences, ticking off our charitable objectives and using the library, the lecture theatre and the council room in ways that have never really been used before. And we've, most of the ways, most of the teachers and the students that we've reached has initially been through word of mouth. And um, primary school teachers work together in networks and they talk a lot. But like I said, the, the downside is that it's London centric. So this particular project came about almost by chance and serendipitous overlapping of our skills. But it's been a great structure for the future. And we've shown our fellows, our members, that we can combine history, cutting edge research and open the building successfully. So it really shows um, the importance of a kind of cross-curricular um, approach and our different skill sets in building a really successful programme. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just been <laughs> a great chance for us to, to collaborate Absolutely. and you really can't overstate how much work Sheila has done to do that outreach work, really reach out to the, the local schools in, in, in the city of London. That's something that where well, I wouldn't have known where to start. So thank you. Thank you.